Hello, class. Today I'm going over Chapter 7, Social Media. So, why should we use social media? Well, social media is one of several forms of interpersonal communication that we're able to conduct using what's called a many-to-many -many model. Now, briefly, all the different types of interpersonal communication, the kind of standard ones, one-to-one -one is going to be when you are sending or receiving information to one person, one-to-many, it can be a group or a person sending information to several people, so it's that one person going to many, or it could be several people sending information to one person, which is called a many-to-one model. Now, social media actually falls under what's called the many-to-many -many model. So you're both sending and receiving information from several people. So a large group of people sending and receiving information. Now, traditional communication, particularly mass media communication, is going to be a one-to-many model. So newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, even things like billboards, you have one person or one corporation sending a message out to a large group of people. Now, with the advent of social media, high-speed internet, all that kind of stuff, we're able to send and receive messages between large groups of people across the world. And that way you're able to be both the sender and receiver, whether you are the, uh, the large corporation who wants to get your branded content out there or the person who is looking for a recipe for how to make a pizza or if you want to comment on that restaurant that you just went to or whatever else is going on in your life. So as a social audience, this means that the people who are out there sending and receiving information, yourselves, myself, pretty much anyone out in the, uh, the modern world today, you're engaged in direct content with people, in direct um, messaging with them. So that means that you're able to share things you're passionate about, and you're also able to select specific types of content, depending on, of course, things like um, like algorithms and stuff sometimes will change a little bit of what you're able to see or how quickly you can find something. But for the most part, Whenever we look at audiences on social media, we're looking at people who either really like or really dislike things, and you're often trying to, uh, if you're the person putting content out there, get people to follow or like or share your content, or if you're someone who's really engaged in a particular hobby or something, then you're probably resharing that information online, hoping to send it to other people who are also really into that same hobby. So business-wise, do you need social media to grow? Well, just like other kinds of communication, it depends on what you want to do, and who your audience is. So like we've talked about off and on throughout the semester, you do need to consider your audience's needs. What does your target demographic enjoy doing? Uh, do people in your area maybe go on Facebook a little more than they go on Twitter? Or maybe they go to... Uh, Pinterest a bit more because you're you're someone who's in um, graphic design or you're someone who's maybe repainting houses or something. So you want to have more visuals available for your audience. 
um, look at your standard target audience member. So think about those demographics, geographics, psychographics, and behaviors, and figure out which platforms, if any, would work best for your audience. And also, don't waste people's time. Think about what kinds of valuable content you can put out there. Think of ways that what you're writing is going to benefit your audience and share that important information with them. And whenever you decide to have a, a social media account for a business, you also want to consi consider your posting rate. So think about how often you'll be able to post um, and how often it would benefit your users. Are they people who maybe want to see two or three posts a week or would that be way too much for them? Would it be better to have maybe one post a week instead and limit it to more engaging content as opposed to something that's going to um, happen more frequently but maybe be a bit less engaging? And also, whenever you're considering expanding online, just like with a real life store, like an in-person location, you need to think about the resources you have available. Do you have someone who is capable of making those posts once a week? Are you going to need to hire more staff to handle social media accounts? Are they going to need to know how to make videos too? Will they need to be able to edit pictures? Like what kinds of things will these people need to be able to do? Is this stuff that you can handle by yourself or will you need to have a big enough budget to hire more people? So whenever you're considering expanding online, you need to think about, of course, your own resources. You also need to think about whether or not your audience is online and where are they online. So do a little bit of research and see where your uh, your target audience is located. Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram or TikTok? Like what are they doing? What kinds of things are they viewing already? You can look at competitors to help you figure out where your audience is and develop a strategy from there. Now, one of the things you use and see a lot online are called hashtags. Well, what is a hashtag? A hashtag is that set of two vertical and two horizontal lines put together, um, kind of used a lot in tic-tac-toe. This used to be known as the pound number or hash sign and originally it was used in automated phone menus so you would have to push the pound sign after you selected the number that you wanted uh, so back in ancient times before everyone was online organizing things um, but nowadays we use the hashtag to organize content online and it helps people, uh, both people who are your consumers, people who are looking for your products or services, and you yourself as the person posting information. It helps you to sort through what's online and to organize it in a, a cohesive way. Now, the first recorded hashtag for online use was back in 2007. It came from someone called Chris Messina. And he wrote a tweet where he said, how do you feel about using the hash or pound sign for groups? And he gave an example as in hashtag bar camp. And then he had a message uh, marker and a question mark. And that originally was considered something that would be a little too complex for the average user using hashtags. Well, it's the present in we're in the 2020s and people are still using hashtags and everyone for the most part knows what you're talking about. If you say that 
you have a hashtag whatever. Now, when you're writing hashtags, you want to think about how to use them most effectively. Some platforms only allow you to use one or two, so you want it to be the uh, most relevant and easiest to understand. One way you can do that is by reviewing some trending hashtags or see if there are some kind of pre-written ones for your particular niche, so whatever your business is or even some that are calendar based. So you can like pre-write something and you can do this with posts too, even if we're talking about blog posts or social media ones, look at calendars and see which holidays relate to your particular brand. And it can be a, a really easy way to fill content voids whenever they come up. Um, you can also look at awareness campaigns. For example, if something is Cancer Awareness Month, then and you have something that you think could reasonably relate to that time of the year, then you can include that. Or if it's maybe the beginning of school or some other local holiday. So whenever you're using hashtags, you need to label your content and you use these hashtags to do that. So for example, if you're someone who sells succulents, then you might write a hashtag succulent or hashtag plant life. And that would help your audience connect with your particular brand, your particular product or service. And you want to think about other related interests or themes that might pop up. Uh, for example, the, uh, the picture here has a tiny little cactus in a tiny pot. So maybe you'd put tiny pots on there. Um, but whenever you're, whatever you decide to use with, for your hashtags, you also want to double check what they have. There are some times where a hashtag that at any other time would be perfectly reasonable and understandable to relate to your product or service, but it might also relate to something else. For example, hashtag plant life could be succulents. It could also refer to marijuana. So see how it's trending at the time whenever you post something and use your best judgment. Now, a few general recommendations for hashtags. Of course, you want to avoid overusing them. If you have 12 or 15 hashtags, depending on the platform, it might mark you as spam. And of course, if you put a bunch of completely unrelated hashtags on your content, then it will... Um, deter people you know they won't really want to look at it if they say like oh well this person's just linking a bunch of stuff so they can get more views so I don't really want to look at their content anymore or whenever you're thinking about what kinds of hashtags and you're coming up short you can't think about you can't figure out what to put think about branded content for example if we're talking about a Halloween store then maybe spooky sweepstakes would be a good one or if we're talking about saints and saints memorabilia, who that nation would be a good one. Or putting even hashtag saints football or something. Um, you can also look at related topics. So if we're talking about a travel agency or traveling to a particular location, we could put hashtag travel and hashtag tourism would also work. Now, a few specific social media platform hashtag uh, pieces of information. First, X, so X slash formerly Twitter, they, uh, they recommend only using one or two hashtags per post. And you want to highlight keywords in your post or something relevant to whatever image you're sharing, if you're sharing an image on there. Facebook 
is another one where they say only one or two hashtags. And you even have an, abil an ability to monitor hashtags if you go to facebook.com backslash hashtag backslash and then you put in the hashtag information there. So if we did uh, tourism, for example, we would do facebook.com backslash hashtag backslash. So it's the word hashtag right there, by the way. Um, and then it would be hashtag tourism. And you could see every post uh, most starting with the most recent ones using that particular hashtag. Now, Instagram allows up to 30 hashtags per post. However, the platform recommends no more than five or 10. Those are the ones that tend to get the best engagement. And also a great way to keep your post looking clean is to include those hashtags as the first comment instead of within the uh, caption. Now a couple more. Um, Pinterest generally doesn't use hashtags. They have been included a few different times, but that's one where it's like zero to two hashtags would be within the uh, the best number. Um, and whenever you look at those, think about things that are recurring. So if you're selling potted plants, then you might put potted plant ideas as one or something else that could be used year after year. So those evergreen ideas. TikTok, we're looking at four or five hashtags for most posts on there. And usually if you split it up between something that's more branded content and then a couple of broader trend ideas, then that'll be the best use of those hashtags. Now, LinkedIn is a bit more of a professional social media site and they say using one or two hashtags is good it will be marked as spam if you write more than five so when you're writing those keep that in mind also that you want to think of tags that would look a little more professional than maybe something you would post on insta um, youtube you want to have uh, two or three hashtags in your title or maybe in the description. And this is another one where if you exceed a certain number, in this case, 15 hashtags, then it will be blocked and marked as spam. All right, now that we've talked about hashtags quite a bit, think about some of the ones that you've seen recently, like what were some of the tags that you saw on the last TikTok video you watched? Did it seem like it was in line with the uh, the message the rest of the video was sending? Or like if you saw some on Snapchat, what did they, how did they relate to the content you viewed on there? All right, let's move on to social media marketing. Now, when we talk about marketing, and we'll go over this a little more whenever we uh, we discuss mark the advertising and marketing chapters, but one of the key terms you want to review is something called ROI, and that stands for return on investment. And basically, this is one of those like, how much are you getting out of this compared to what it's costing you, whether that cost is happening in uh, money that you're spending or your personal time if you're, you know, doing it yourself. So how do you calculate ROI? You take the net benefits. So anything after your other costs have been paid and you divide that by your total cost. So how much benefit are you getting out of this compared to how much it's costing you? 
For example, um, if you decided to do a pay-per-click advertising campaign, you could see how many clicks you're getting out of it and figure out whether or not you're getting your money's worth. So you would divide the amount that you're paying for that advertising um, by the amount of, well, you divide the amount of benefit you're getting from those pay-per-click advertisements. So how many people are actually clicking and going to your website and buying things compared to the total cost. Now, another example, if we're talking, of course, about quote-unquote free marketing, well, the reason it's in quotes is this is the kind of thing where you're your own marketing team. So technically, you're spending your time on this and you should value your time. So think about the net benefit you're receiving from you um, developing this advertising or marketing campaign or the amount of time you're spending posting to social media divided by the cost of your time. Now, whenever you develop social media ROI, you want to define your objectives. So think about what it is you're trying to accomplish by being on social media. Are you trying to improve conversations about your business? Are you trying to drive people to your website? Do you want more people to show up to your physical location? Like if you're a coffee shop, maybe you want people to show up over there. Or are you doing a uh, kind of a customer survey where you want people to give you some specific direct input through X or through uh, Instagram or something where you can see what their experience is like at your location and they can share it with you and with other people online. So think about what your... Um, what you're trying to get out of posting on social media other than, so there should be more than just the end of I am posting on social media. Think about why are you posting on social media? What are you trying to get out of it? And one way to help you figure out your goals is to look at what are called SMART goals. And SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely or time-bound. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So how can you be smart in your goals? Well, the first thing you can do is track your metrics. So see how your um, how your specific pieces of information relate to your objectives, make sure that you are following the correct information, that you're understanding what you're collecting, um, and making sure that you're connecting with your audience in the way that you want to. Now, this is a very like cursory overview kind of thing. Again, we are going a little more in depth about this uh, during the marketing chapter, but in general, you want to look at both what are called quantitative and qualitative metrics whenever you're viewing your, uh, your online statistics and trying to measure everything on there. So you want to see what's working and what doesn't work, and that'll help you figure out your return on investment and whether or not it's worth it for you to uh, continue posting online or if this is something where your time could be better spent elsewhere. So how do you measure those things? Well, we can use SEO and SEM. So one of the ways that you can connect with your audience is by using search engine optimization or SEO. And the way you do that is by including keywords or by using specific hashtags related to your content. So whatever products or services that you are providing and in a way that it'll get picked up by 
uh, search engines and also by things that your audience would naturally associate to your product or service. And you also can do this by developing links between multiple articles that you've posted um, within your website. And also if you're, um, if you're maybe related to multiple websites, for example, if you run a coffee shop, then you want to make sure that you appear on things like Yelp or Google reviews. And so your audience is able to find you and they can find out a little more about you since most people, especially people who are not native to an area are going to look at reviews before they go to a location. Now, search engine optimization results in more of a, a natural uh, post online. It means that you're ending up in like the top 10 spots more naturally because you include all of those key terms or ideas that both search al algorithms and your audience are looking for. Uh, now, that is also kind of the negative about just using search engine optimization is search algorithms change and that could mean that your content all of a sudden doesn't match as well as an, a new website that popped up. So you need to kind of tweak things as you continue your online presence, but also to generally um, review that search engine information and use it along with other marketing tools. And one of those other tools is search engine marketing. And this is where you see things like pay-per-click content. So the sponsored content at the beginning before you see whatever the normal search results are on Google, um, that would be from what's called search engine marketing. So it is technically still relevant to whatever the person is searching probably, but it also was sponsored content. It's something that someone paid to have at the top of the search results. And one of the good things as the, um, the company owner is that you're going to see immediate results from search engine marketing. You can see right away whether or not people are clicking on it. Same thing if we're looking at things like banner ads too. It's, um, it's popping up right away and you can immediately see if people are clicking on those links or not or if you're getting more traffic after people view those items if they aren't necessarily directly clicking on it. Um, and also, uh, SEM is not subject to search algorithm changes. I mean, you're paying for this to be there, so it's going to be there no matter what. However, um, depending on who you ask, sometimes search engine marketing is considered the kind of overall category that includes search engine optimization, SEO. But whatever you decide to use, if you're... Uh, primarily sharing your information online, then both SEM and SEO are needed to develop a strong web presence. So let's look at some of the social media data that you might find online. Now, when you look at social media data, one of the things you'll do is what's called social media monitoring. And this is the, um, whenever you see people pointing to graphs and stuff of what's happening on a particular website, that's when they are doing social media monitoring. They're usually reviewing metrics or quantifiable data. So something that you can count and you can say specifically, okay, we had 10 clicks on this post. We had 100 likes on this other post or whatever it is. Um, you can also review how many times your brand was mentioned by 
uh, audience members on a platform. So if you're on Instagram, you can see how many times your your um, company was included in a hashtag on there, or you can see how many posts were made with a particular location, or you can see how many times your you can also compare it to how many times your competitor was mentioned on that platform. And you can also follow general industry trends by reviewing the metrics of particular websites, uh, search engine results, or social media posting. Now, social listening involves what's called more qualitative data. So this is talking about the mood. Um, we're looking more at psychographic type of stuff where people are providing feedback for your restaurant or your coffee shop. That's where we're, we're getting more um, soft data type stuff where people say um, the food was okay, but I didn't want to eat it because the the restaurant looked gross or whatever it was. This is where more of that kind of um, written feedback comes into play. So instead of just counting the number of times that someone left a four star review you can you're actually looking at what was behind that four star review and same as with um social media with the other type of social media uh monitoring when we're looking when we look at metrics um and are counting specific numbers of things now we can view that sentiment both of our competitors and for our own company's engagement. And it can help to uh, pinpoint issues that are happening either on the website or with a uh, an app. To You'll see those a lot online if, um, if an update goes out and it it takes on all of the um, Android operating system programs, then a bunch of people will usually post online and say, oh, uh, you know, one star, this isn't working and your last post sucked and whatever. And then you can go back and fix it and have people try it again, hopefully. Um, and this kind of data, both... Uh, Quantitative and qualitative data can be used to improve sales or whatever other kind of engagement you're involved in. Now, another way to gather data from your audience is through what's called A-B testing. And this is also known as split testing. And it's a way to create real world research. You can post two articles and that are you can make two different posts for example of the same article and you can change the headlines for them and see which one gets more engagement and that can help you to figure out how to market to your audience better in the future for example when you're writing and figuring out what kinds of script changes you want to to make, then you can count things like how long the post was. Did it include 10 words or 15 words? Um, were there statistics? Did it include a picture? Did I use exclamation points or question marks in there? Um, for example, if we're writing posts about coffee shops in our area and you have an article that says 10 best cafes for singles versus what are the top coffee shops? Well, different aspects of a coffee shop can make it considered the top coffee place. So if you're, maybe your audience wants to focus on a specific part of it. So you want to focus on the uh, the dating scene portion. So you have the singles part or maybe the uh, best espresso or a shop that includes gelato in addition to coffee. So think about which uh, 
which things relate most to your audience and you can change the wording to fit your audience and also use that a b testing to try out a couple different versions of it so not like going crazy with 10 or something but two maybe three different uh, styles and see what works best for you now a few other things that you might change in your posting language language would be to include emojis. Um, you can see in this post by Antony's Italian Cafe, they included a bunch of emojis and hashtags in here and started with the uh, direct you question, have you tried our bruschetta pomodoro yet? And then they, since they figure that some people might not know what's on that, they wrote they included a uh, a little you know tasty face and diced tomatoes roasted garlic and fresh basil so they describe what's in the dish and they also have a picture with their logo and the phrase have you tried our dot 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 and then a picture of the item so they're trying to uh, show off their items and also connect with their audience who might enjoy this kind of appetizer. So when you're looking at posting language, think about if your audience would prefer a more casual or formal voice, maybe they wanna see pictures of it. Usually if your most posts online nowadays, people will include some kind of relevant photo with it. Um, the only one I can think of where maybe a photo wouldn't work quite as well would be something like LinkedIn, where it's a little more formal, or when you're thinking about how your post shows up in a search engine, you're going to just see the title right there. But whatever you decide to do, consistency is key. So making sure that if you keep that kind of casual eatery style in your posts that it matches along with your restaurant and that everything kind of flows together and makes sense for your audience so they don't show up in a, a suit and tie to a, a casual lunch spot. All right, and if you haven't started yet of course please review chapters six and seven your test will be opening soon um, start working on writing project four i'll go over it after group jeopardy on friday and i will see you then